Hi, everyone. I'm Ethan Heilman from uh, Commonwealth Crypto and Boston University. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about blind signatures. And I, I really want to encourage everyone to uh, ask questions. Um, after some of the slides, I'll, I'll, I'll pause to give people time. We can uh, think of any, any questions. Um, so what are blind signatures? Well, a very informal definition of blind signatures is a signature scheme which allows one party to sign a message without learning what that message is. And if you think about this, this is very strange. Often the way in which signatures are used is that they're used to um, authenticate someone saying something. So like, I can prove that Alice authenticated this message. But it's very strange to imagine Alice authenticating a message that she doesn't know. Sort of almost, it's not quite the opposite of what signatures uh, are designed for, but it's, it's an odd thing. Alice has authenticated something but she doesn't know what it was that it was authenticated and she can't recognize later that, that this was the thing that she authenticated other than the fact that she authenticated it. Um, and one metaphor I've heard for describing this is um, imagine you have, uh, how many people here are familiar with carbon copy paper? All right, so you have a piece of paper and when you write on the top of it, um, the signature goes into the paper below it. Um, and so you can imagine creating, say, like a contract and then hiding what the actual contract says and having someone sign on carbon copy on top. So they don't see what they signed, but later someone can prove that they signed it because the paper underneath has the signature on it. So this very strange thing, um, uh, blind signatures, was invented um, in 1982 for a very specific purpose. Um, and it's something that I find really interesting because um, prior to Bitcoin, this was one of the major uh, like uh, digital or virtual currency systems. So David Chom in 1982 um, invented blind signatures uh, specifically for a scheme that he called anonymous eCash, which he attempted to industrialize. Um, and the idea behind anonymous eCash and the reason that it uses blind signatures is that it enabled a trusted party, such as a bank, to issue these coins, um, and the bank couldn't tell how the coins were spent. So the bank would know I issued some coin to Alice, the bank would know that Bob redeemed some coin at the bank, but the bank would not know that Alice paid Bob. It would not be able to link the two coins. And so to explain blind signatures, I'm first going to explain anonymous eCash. So, before I explain anonymous eCash, let's look at the, the non-anonymous version with just regular signatures. So we have a bank here. Uh, the bank has a private and secret key. Everyone knows what the bank's private and secret key is. Um, uh, Alice and Bob both have accounts at the bank. Um, this is an assumption behind anonymous eCash. Um, and so uh, Alice wants a, wants a coin so she can pay Bob. So what Alice is going to do is she's going to ask the bank to debit her account a certain amount um, uh, and issue her a coin. And the way in which the bank issues her a coin is that Alice chooses a random um, number that we call the serial number, or SN. The bank uh, signs the serial number, basically saying, I've authorized one coin to Alice. Um, and we're going to use signature to represent signatures here. And then when Alice wants to buy something from Bob, the way that she does this is that she um, sends her coin to Bob. And her coin consists of her serial number and a signature that shows that this serial number is, in fact, authorized by the, the bank. Uh, Bob gets this, um, but there's a problem here. Bob doesn't know if Alice has sent this to someone else, right? Alice could send this to like 50 different people. Um, so it requires, the bank is required to detect and prevent double spending. So Bob sends the, the coin to the bank. Um, and the bank checks that this serial number has not been used before. If this serial number has been used before, this would be considered a double spend under the system. Um, and the bank checks that 
uh, that Sigma is a valid signature under the bank's um, secret key. Um, and if it is, uh, the bank takes the coin from Bob um, and uh, credits Bob um, that coin in his bank account. Now remember I said that this is a non-anonymous version of this scheme. This scheme does not provide any privacy. And the reason it doesn't provide any privacy is that the serial number that, that uh, Alice sends to the bank um, to be issued the coin uh, can be linked to the serial number when Bob redeems the coin at the bank. So clearly the bank can tell, I gave this coin to Alice, Alice then spent it to Bob, and Bob redeemed it. So to solve this problem, blind signatures were invented. And I'm just going to be talking about uh, RSA blind signatures. Um, there's many other blind signature schemes out there. So uh, as before, Alice chooses a random serial number. Um, however, now Alice blinds the serial number with a random, num a random number R. And we call R the blinding factor. Um, so she has some function that takes her serial number and takes R um, and generates a blind serial number. Um, now Alice sends this, sends this blind serial number to the signer to get a blind signature. So the signer takes uh, the blind serial number and its secret key and signs it and generates a blinded signature. But notice the, the, the signer does not actually see what the serial number is. It only sees this uh, random serial, uh, sees this blinded serial number. Um, Alice gets the, um, uh, the blind signature back um, and she is a function unblind. And since she knows R, she can unblind the signature and get the real signature back. Um, and now Alice has a signature on the serial number um, but she's never actually revealed what the serial number is to the signer. The signer knows it signed something, but it doesn't know what it signed. So returning to our scenario before, um, let's use blind signatures to make this uh, uh, scheme private. So Alice chooses her serial number. Um, she blinds it. She sends the blind serial number to the bank. The bank signs the blinded serial number to generate a um, blinded signature. Alice unblinds the blinded signature to get a regular signature. Um, and then it works as before. To pay Bob, she sends her serial number and this signature to Bob. Um, Bob then uh, redeems this, this coin, essentially this serial number and signature, to the bank. Uh, the bank then makes sure that the serial number has not been spent before. Um, and that the signature is valid and credits banks, Bob's bank account. Um, but notice that this is the first time the bank's seen the serial number. Um, uh, all the bank saw before was this blinded serial number, which it doesn't know what it is. Yes? So, so if, if Alice Bank listed several Bob's records, that would first be the bank's bank account? Exactly. Um, so Bob should not. Uh, this is this is a very different situation um, than 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 Bitcoin. You know, this is from 36 years ago at this point. Um, so Bob, you know, is running a, a merchant store on the internet, and Alice shows up and is like, "I want to spend this coin." Bob immediately checks with the bank to see if it's been double spent. If it hasn't, then Bob re redeems the good to Alice and gets the deposit. If it has, then Bob tells Alice, "No way." Um, and does anyone, or did that answer your question? Um, does anyone have any questions on this slide? All right, well, if you have any questions on this slide or you think of a question, um, after my conclusion, I have this slide again. Um, and this is uh, uh, important construction to use in privacy protocols because it enables a third party to issue coins without being able to link those coins when they are uh, redeemed. All right, so when we say that this is private, what do we actually mean? Well, the privacy definition, I'm going to give you a very informal definition here. Um, the privacy definition um, is uh, unlinkability. And the idea with unlinkability is that um, 
any blinded serial number can be unblinded to any other serial number. Um, and this means that a blinded serial number can't be linked to a serial number. So if you have a pair of blinded serial number, if you have a blinded serial number and a serial number, and you want to say, are these in some way related? Was this blinded serial number the serial number that was issued, and then the serial number is the redeemed version? Well, I can always invent an R that will, will relate them in that way. And because I can always invent an R, you don't, there's no way of telling that a blinded serial number unblinded to a particular serial number. Um, it's similar to if people are familiar with like one-time pads, like given a ciphertext and a plain text, you can always invent a key that will relate them. Um, and so you don't learn seeing the blinded serial number and the serial number, you don't learn um, any connection between the two of them. Does anyone have any questions on that? So if I understand your question, you're asking, is there a link in the timing? Um, so there definitely is. Um, and this unlinkability definition does not capture any sort of um, timing link. For instance, if the bank only issued one coin and then had one coin redeemed, the bank would totally know that those are the two same coins. Um, and the, th these sorts of timing attacks are actually uh, fairly power powerful, especially when there's a low number of users, um, or especially when users behave and like imagine that a user, imagine that every user in the system, they get a coin and then they just immediately spend it. Um, if that's just what the user behavior is, the, the bank doesn't know for sure maybe two people spent the coin at the same time, but the anonymity set is not, the number of people that it could be is actually fairly small. So that's an excellent question and these sorts of timing channels are, are, are very important to think about when using a system like this and are not at all captured. You can have a system that has total unlinkability and has one user and you always know who that user spent. Um, so lots of users, you almost, it's like you need a, a crowd to hide in um, and the user behavior has to be such that it also provides a crowd, not that they just instantly spend. Um, so we, this description has been RSA blind signatures. I won't talk about other blind signature schemes, but there's um, a large number. Um, there's, uh, uh, so like things like the um, BLS signatures that uh, everyone's very excited about um, have blind signature co components. There's many different um, blind signature schemes out there. Um, all right, so. Uh, BLS, yeah. Um, so those are the the shorter. Um, I think they're like 32, 32 bytes. Um, uh, I think, I believe these are the ones that um, uh, bulletproofs use. Um, they're 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 very cool, and there are blind signature schemes out here. I'm doing RSA because it was the first one that was invented, um, and many other signature blind signature schemes have different properties that are a little bit more complex. Um, but RSA is sort of the, the original blind signature scheme um, and the easiest one to understand um, and the one that most people are using right now. So I'm gonna go a little bit more into the um, uh, math behind how this works. Um, uh, please ask me questions. Um, so for RSA signatures, and this is gonna be fairly high level, um, but I'm just gonna give you a flavor of it. So uh, RSA signatures, you have a public key, which is a value E and a value N, um, and you have a secret key, which is a value D and a value N, um, and all the operations are gonna be do, done mod N, where N is the product of two primes. Um, and the really important thing to take away is that you have two operations um, you can do here uh, for RSA. You have the first one, which raises some value x to the value e mod n. And you have the second one, which I'm gonna call RSA inverts, which raises um, some value y to uh, this value d, which you see associated with the secret key mod n. Um, and because these two are inverses, if you take, if you choose some x 
and you apply um, this RSA operation to it, and then you apply the inverse, what will end up happening is you'll get x mod n back out because the, um, the E and the D will uh, essentially cancel because they're inverses of each other, and so you'll just get X. Does anyone have any questions on that? No, all right. So a really simple version of a signature scheme in RSA is, um, you take a message, you hash it, and then you compute the inverse RSA um, on this. Now you have to be very careful on, um, um, uh, you have to be very careful about the hash function used. Um, there's a lot of uh, important details. Uh, no one should go write code based on this. Um, but at a high level, you hash the message and then you compute this inverse RSA operation. Um, and uh, this gets you a signature. And when you want to verify, you take the signature and you do the regular RSA operation. Um, because they're inverses, you'll end up with uh, an output that's the hash of the message mod n, um, and you can compare the hash of the message because you have it and verify the signature. Any questions on this? All right. So. For blind signatures, you're going to take the, uh, it's, it's, it's very similar, but with one extra step. So you're going to take the hash of the message, um, and remember that blinding factor R? You're going to multiply, so you're going to take R and raise it to the E, um, essentially raise it to the public key, um, and you're gonna multiply that with the hash of, hash of M. And this is your blinded message, or what we were calling your blinded serial number when we were talking about anonymous eCache. Um, and so when you go to send this to be signed, um, the signature is this inverse RSA operation, which is essentially just raising your blinded message to D mod N. Um, and when you work out the math, it's the hash of M times R to the E to the D. Um, and the and this is going to cancel out the E. So what your uh, blinded message looks like is the hash of M to the D times R. And remember, this is your signature. So it's basically your signature times a random number, mod N. And then to unblind, um, you, uh, you divide by R. And since it's just the hash of M to the D times R divided by R, this cancels out and you end up with the hash of M uh, raised to the D mod N, which you'll recognize as the signature. Does anyone have any questions on this? The important takeaway here is that you are multiplying times um, R to the E and that's going to, when they sign it, that's going to get rid of the E, and then you just divide the R out. So you're basically just adding um, random noise uh, and then subtracting that random noise. You're just having to be careful about it because this has to work uh, under this exponentiation to the D. And the E and D here, um, generally, we're using this for signatures, but uh, E is used because it stands for like encryption and decryption because they're inverses of each other. And so if you're using RSA to do encryption, the E would be the value that you raise to, to encrypt, and the D would be the value that you raise to, to decrypt. Um, all right. So does anyone have any questions on all of that? I'm going to move on to a, um, a, a scheme, another scheme which uses uh, um, blind RSA. All right, so you can use um, blind RSA to do uh, blind decryption. Um, so in this, we're gonna assume that Bob has a public and secret key pair. Um, and so what Bob's gonna do in this scenario is Bob is going to encrypt two files 
using AES using key one and key two. Um, and uh, the encryptions of these files will be ciphertext one and ciphertext two. Um, uh, Bob's going to use his public key to also encrypt these, uh, encrypt key one and key two under his public key. Um, and the goal here is that Alice is going to um, uh, request a decryption, and Bob won't know which file Alice decrypted. Um, so Bob publishes uh, Z1, which is the encryption under his public key, the RSA encryption under his public key of the first key, and Z2, which is the encryption of the second key. I'm going to publish these. Uh, Alice sees them. Um, Alice then can. So Alice wants to get, say, uh, Z2. Let's say she wants to learn, she wants to get Bob to decrypt Z2 for her. Um, so if she were just to ask Bob, hey, decrypt Z, uh, decrypt Z2 for me, um, Bob would uh, know which file she encrypted. Um, she, she, she got the decryption of. So what she can do is she can blind uh, Z2 and ask Bob, hey, decrypt blinded Z2 for me um, using RSA blinding. Um, uh, Bob blindly decrypts blinded Z2, um, sends blinded key 2, because the decryption of blinded Z2, remember, is uh, K2 is the key, um, still blinded. Uh, Alice unblinds the key, um, and now she can encrypt uh, file number 2 um, using, the, uh, using K2. Um, and Bob doesn't learn which of these files Alice decrypted. Um, so Alice was able to uh, ask Bob for a decryption without revealing which of the files Alice, Alice um, actually got the decryption on. And in this example, we just used two files, um, but you could use this with lots of files. Um, in fact, you could even have like a third party where Bob is just um, uh, encrypting files under this third party's public key, and then Alice is requesting decryptions. Um, and this is a fairly this is a fairly like valuable thing to do. So we use this in the in the Tumblebit protocol, so that a party can get decryptions on things without revealing what it's actually getting decryptions on. All right, so. In conclusion, we talked about anonymous eCache and blind signatures. Um, we showed how to build blind signatures using RSA. Um, and then we also gave an example of using RSA for blind decryption. Um, these protocols are, are used in um, a lot of Bitcoin privacy protocols. So Zero, zero Link is using, um, is using RSA blind signatures uh, to produce um, uh, coin joins that have privacy from the party that's joining all the coins. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, uh, Tumblebit is using a lot of this um, for, uh, for other privacy, um, Bitcoin privacy protocols. So does anyone have any questions on anything I discussed? So your question is, what is the computational cost of unblinding and blinding? Um, so I don't actually know. Um, it's 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 totally doable. I don't have any like performance numbers off the top of my head, um, but I believe it's less than computing an RSA signature. Um, it's essentially dividing mod n. Um, so you have to compute uh, inverse um, uh, of, of the blinding factor and then multiply that across. Um, but it's like fast enough that you can do it on a, on a, on a computer quickly enough that you wouldn't notice. Um, uh, it's probably not as fast as uh, ECDSA um, operations uh, on, um, on Bitcoin's curve.
All right, if there's no more questions, um, I think I'll hand it over to the next speaker.